Center of Public Ministry here at United, and it's my deep honor to introduce Winona LaDuke. Winona is a Native American activist, environmentalist, economist, writer, and friend. She's an enrolled member of the Mississippi Band of Anishinaabe and lives and works on White Earth reservations. She received a degree in rural economic development from Harvard and her MA in community community economic develop, uh, development from Antioch University. Winona was the founding director of the White Earth Land Recovery Project and currently serves as the executive director of Honor, <coughs> excuse me, Honor the Earth, an organization she co-founded with the Indigo Girls, how cool is that, <laughs> whose mission it is to create awareness and support for native environmental issues and develop needed financial and political resources for the survival of sustainable Native communities. She is the author of several exceptional books, including Last Woman Standing, All Our Relations, Native Struggles for Land and Life, and Recovering the Sacred, The Power of Naming and Claiming. Winona is the recipient of numerous awards and distinctions, including the Thomas Merton Award, the Baja Community Service Award, the Anne Bancroft Award for Women's Leadership Fellowship, the Reebok Human Rights Award. She was identified as the Ms. Magazine Woman of the Year. She's been in inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame and my personal favorite, a guest on the Colbert Report. <laughs> in 1994, she was identified by Time Magazine as one of America's 50 most promising leaders under 40. And while she is no longer under 40, she continues to fulfill that promise. <laughs> I learned from my wife, my wife Joy, recently that Winona's uh, favorite word in recent months is fabulous. So it's my distinct privilege to introduce the thoughtful, passionate, strategic, innovative, insightful, and always fabulous Winona yeah. LaDuke. Very funny. So I uh, have a have a Hawaiian friend who's I don't know why every year she calls me up and she says, "What is your word?" Fabulous. <laughs> I said that was a good one. And uh, so and and then uh, some of my staff said, "You sound like a gay man every time you say that." <laughs> That's really fabulous, you know. And I said, oh, it's just "Fabulous" is a good word. So that was my word of the year. I decided it's like uh, a word. So. Thank you very much for the honor of being here with you today. I, uh, it's very nice, and thank you for being so uh, gracious with my schedule a little bit. I should just tell you, I am, I'm not Christian. I don't know if you know that. I hope that's not a newsflash. Um, <laughs> I'm a member of our Medewin Society and uh, our Big Drum Society, which is a pretty darn old. Been around 5,000 years or so in this area. And uh, we are, uh, we're, we're good. I was up on, um, at Mauna Kawaning Manis, which, since I'm not Christian, I don't know what the equivalent is, but in our, in our instructions uh, by the prophets who came to our people, we were uh, instructed to move from the eastern seaboard, the great seas, to, uh, to the west, where the, to the place where the food grows upon the water. And our Anishinaabe people, that's wild rice, of course. I guess you gathered that, yeah. And our Anishinaabe people, uh, we followed a shell, a migas that appeared in the sky. That is our story, and uh, we came here to this Oma'a King, this beautiful land, and the place we were intended to go is uh, Monica Wanning Manis, also called Madeline Island, which, that is where I was. And, uh, you know, for those of you, do any of you have cabins up there or go up there? Yeah, this is the, so I want to talk to you by tomorrow, okay? Yeah. We have some ideas we're working on, but um, 
Having said that, I, uh, we go up there and we had, our, um, we had our bear ceremonies, which have not been had there for a while. We had the bear ceremonies up there. And it uh, turns out they don't run in a timely manner. And it turns out the fairy does. So Cindy was most gracious to assist in, uh, in juggling me a bit because uh, I could not make the last fairy and I could only make the fairy this morning. So there you go, but thank you very much for uh, being understanding. I, I try as best as I can and I was real happy uh, to get here uh, where we are. Um, as I reflected, you know, I have, I'm talking to you twice. So and, unless you have a really bad memory, I'm going to have to come up with something completely interesting tomorrow. So I've, I have like two sets of notes and I was kind of going over them and, and I, I started reflecting. I really uh, very much, uh, where did she go? Who was just talking? Robin. I like that very much. It's very good. And we, we talked about getting a sheep. Yes, I, I like to eat the sheep. Um, you want to come and pick it up? Yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a uh, horse trailer. I'll be there. <laughs> I'm a pragmatic woman. Um, I, uh, I was ref when she was talking, I, I thought I would tell you that my father, he passed away a while ago, almost 20 years ago, but he um, was a great spiritual leader and a, a great, great man. And um, he used to say to me, which you reminded me of, which he used to say to me, uh, Winona, you're a really, really smart uh, woman. He said, but I don't want to hear your philosophy if you can't grow corn. <laughs> uh, so he used to say to me, and I, you know, I thought that when you were talking, and I, and I, uh, I've, I've now, now become a corn grower. It took me a while, and uh, I'll probably talk a little bit about that tomorrow. But um, it is true that to, to that uh, there's something about the spiritual practice of uh, relating to all our relatives, whether they have wings or fins or roots or hooves, that I think makes us better people, and makes how we think. Uh, better than what we articulate. So in saying that, let me get a little to the subject. Um, I guess we are now in Wabaganagizes, Wabaganagizes, which is uh, what we call this moon in Oma King here on this land. It means a flower moon. Uh, we just ended Iskigami Zigigizes, which is a maple syrup in there. Yeah. And uh, for us, it was a pretty good season because that last cold was good. Um, although the rest of you were whining, I'm sure. <laughs> we were syrup. Yeah, we were making maple syrup while you were whining. <laughs> I know, it was funny because I have, do you, I don't know if any of you work with someone who you could call Eeyore. I have this guy I work with and he's like, oh, like that all the time. I think Joy might know who this person is, but we just call him Eeyore. And he's like, oh, it's not a very good year. It's always every time this, the harvest is going to be no good, there'll be no rice and there's no syrup. You know, do you know people like this? Oh, you know, it's very hard because I try to, I'm generally kind of optimistic. I think it's better to be <laughs> optimistic. And so he was just like that, you know, just like that. And I said, it ain't over till the fat lady sings, buddy. You know, I mean, you don't know what's going to happen, you know. So it ain't over till it's over. And there, sure enough, we got another week that was fabulous. You know? At which point, at the end, he was saying, oh, I'm so tired. Uh. <laughs> A tractor doesn't work anymore. So I was like, oh, oh I, I am thankful. I'm thankful for this harvest. But, um, yeah. So this one is Wabaganagizis, which is a little easier on my friend there. It's a flower moon. And then we have Oday Minagizis, a strawberry moon. Oday is a heart berry. That's why they uh, call it that, Oday Minagizis. And then we have Minagizis, blueberry moon. Then we have a moon that follows that that is uh, Mano Minagizis, Mano Minagizis, which you know, which is wild rice making moon. And then we have a moon that is called uh, Watebaga Gizis when the leaves change color. Mm. And then we have a, a moon that is called uh, Banakwe Ogizis, when they fall. Then we have a moon Gashkadno Ogizis, which is around November, the freezing over moon. Yeah, it is. Uh, and then uh, Manadu Gizis soon's little spirit moon, Gishi Manadu Gizis, great spirit moon. Neme Benagizis, Neme Benagizis is um, a sucker moon. The sucker moon, which uh, I think is when the suckers run under the ice, which I have never seen a sucker run 
<laughs> it's a strange, isn't that a strange term? It is, the suckers are moving, I think is what they mean, but fish do not run generally. And then, anabonagesis, uh, uh, anabonagesis. I'm going to have you try to say that, anabonagesis. Anabonagesis. That's, that's not too hard. Huh? That one is uh, my personal favorite. I like how it sounds. It also means uh, the uh, hard-crusted snow moon. It's about March when, you know, it, it, it freezes, then it thaws, and it freezes again. Yeah. And um, so then, is Kigami Zikigiza, a maple syrup moon. I thought you might like to hear uh, the moons that are Oma'a king from this land, if you had not heard them spoken. Um, I'm a little further north in my community, but it is pretty much the same, pretty darn close, I'd say, yeah? Um, how it is that people have uh, uh, moons or a calendar that is related to land, how our language sounds. And then I also uh, thought you might, you know, I don't know if you noticed that none of those moons are named after a Roman emperor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's possible. It is possible to have an entire worldview that has nothing to do with empire. <laughs> so I thought that that would be a good, a good start and, and something to consider, you know. And uh, having been around a lot, I know that generally uh, indigenous thinking is not viewed as of the same standard as that that comes from uh, Western universities or Europe. <clears throat> as you, you know, as you heard, I was an undergraduate at Harvard. It's funny, I just went back to Harvard. I got a president's medal from Harvard. And uh, my father asked me, my, my, my stepfather, he asked me, he said, what are they giving you an award for, Winona? I said, you know, it was kind of, anyway, I said, uh, the student the university was happiest to see leave. <laughs> it was not a long time, but it was an era of great campus activism. And uh, we, we, uh, was the, when we were trying to get Harvard to divest of its stock in South Africa. Mm. And so there was a lot of occupations, and there was a lot of churches involved as well. And, uh, and, uh, but actually, I, I got a medal for my activism. Mm. And I thought, that's a really amazing thing, that 30 years later, after you leave, they, uh, you know, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, that's exactly right. I graduated, and they're glad to see that. But yeah, it was interesting, but... Uh, um, when I was at Harvard, I remember that if you wanted to um, study the art from Europe, you would go to the fine arts department. And if you wanted to study the art from Native America, you would go to anthropology. Mm. And I, I say that to you because that is kind of the, the nature of uh, teaching of empire. And the idea that not all people's art is equal. Yeah. And that it is the same, you know, with many of the teachings we have as indigenous people, they're not valued you know, in this society, whether it is uh, the pharmacology, you know. I mean, I'm sure that without indigenous pharmacology from here, like the aspirin, you might still be sticking leeches on your forehead, you know. <laughs> it is true, right? That was a practice from someplace else. I mean, right? There's different practices, you know. That well, was handy to get that aspirin, huh? Quinine and you know the the great foods. I always like to talk about the great foods. I mean, we get no credit for those, you know. I always like so th these words um, is um, avocado, chocolatel, potato, and tomato. Mm. Hmm. Do you ever think about that? Okay, that's no, those are Nahuatl words. Nahuatl words from northern Mexico, meaning that all those foods came from there or came from the Americas, right? <laughs> And uh, you know what would it tell, what would the world be without chocolate? I was just dousing some up there in the. <laughs> thank you again for the chocolate. But uh, you know what I'm saying is is that we don't know the origin, and so we lose uh, relationship to uh, a lot. And the creation of empire, and then uh, so empire requires at some level, kind of the diminishment of those you are seeking to conquer. You know, and so you don't get credit for that. You don't get credit for democracy, you know? I mean, the reality is, is your founding fathers, uh, founding fathers were coming from uh, monarchy and feudalism, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't have, they had a hunger to find something better, but did not have experience, yep. Yep. right? Yeah, and so they, you know, they went and uh, Ben Franklin and those guys went to see the Iroquois Confederacy, right? Mm -hmm. 
you know, and try to learn and took some pretty good notes except for so big emissions in there, you know. <laughs> You know, but I always find it interesting because I, I think that the question of leadership, which you, you know, are addressing here a lot, and, and I, I know that Joy and I talk about this, or we talk about this in the Native community, is how you raise chiefs or how you raise leaders these days. You know, because we used to have a really a long practice of that, and I don't know if we are doing that in any community these days. But uh, when they would appoint the chiefs, in their long houses, which were the representational democracy that still exists, their long houses of the Iroquois Confederacy, they would appoint chiefs, and uh, in the appointment they called it the condoling of a chief, which I always think is interesting, the condoling, because the responsibility you took as a leader was so great that they passed their condolences on to you, because you were doing that, you know? And uh, I think that that is a good lesson for all of us, you know, because of those of you who are in leadership, you know that it is something that is a great responsibility, yeah. But at the same time in this country, the egregious practices of many politicians, you know, but, but it is, I don't think we condole or we don't consider the significance and um, particularly with the millions spent on campaigns. Um, but then of course the teaching of democracy, which they missed most egregiously was the fact that it was the clan mothers who appointed the chiefs. And women in this country did not get the right to vote until much later. And so, you know, I, I reflect on things that would be better understood or probably we would have a better multicultural healthy society with a little less empire if we considered outside of our paradigm of empire. So having said that, I'm going to say one more thing, which I think might be a discussion topic later. I'm not a religious scholar. But one time, someone said to me that the difference between a lot of native spiritual traditions and a lot of the traditions that I think that most of you represent is that, and, and I don't know, they said that we would call ourselves, uh, we would call the major religions, you know, Christianity, um, and others, uh, Islam, Judaism, we would call those commemorative religions. Mm -hmm. And that quite often there's a commemoration of, a, of events and teachings. Yeah? I don't know. But I thought I'd, you'd be the people to ask, and maybe in a question and answer period. And then we would call ourselves uh, reaffirmation religions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you ever heard this before. Mm -hmm. But the idea is, is that our spiritual practices are, are not based on a series of events. You know, although I did recount our migration, you know, but are, are based on reaffirming relationship to place and to relatives. In our practice, whether it is Madewin or big drum practice or our feastings like I just did up there, the ceremony I just did on the island, you know. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean anything, it's just a, maybe a different way of looking at things, but I thought that was interesting, someone said that to me. And that was during the hearings on the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, is where I heard that in 1997, I was like, huh. Oh. You know, they were held here in Minneapolis. Wellstone conducted them, and uh, it was very interesting because uh, the heads of all the major, did you go to those, George, remember that? But they, they had all the major religious uh, leaders from the Native American church, the Madewin, uh, the, the uh, Six Nations came, the, uh, you know, the uh, Sundance chiefs came, uh, testified here in Minneapolis. And I thought, if you had such a collection of great religious leaders from other religions come, would you not have a larger audience? Yeah? You know, I was blessed to go and listen to them testify, and I was, you know, this felt so good in my heart. And I thought, you know, wow, America is missing. Because they, they, don't, they don't hear these. You know, they don't get to see these great leaders with their spiritual traditions that are very diverse. You know, we have very, very diverse religious traditions in our indigenous communities, you know. So um, that's a little bit about who I am and um, what I was thinking. But what I wanted to talk to you about in this, the first of two <laughs> lectures to you, is this thinking of empire and then some, some questions. Um, questions like, uh, you know, are the rights, does Mother Earth have rights? Is the Holy Land an exclusive construct? And uh, you know, how, do, how does one challenge 
empire and a spiritual practice. So let me talk a little bit about this to the best of my ability, and then I think we have some time for questions. Um, is it really warm in here? I didn't think I was having a hot flash. I think it's just really warm in here. <laughs> it's like really hot. Uh, you don't mind if I take off my jacket? Oh. Um, so there is a place known as the place where the thunder beings rest in their migration from west to east. There is a place uh, known as the sixth resting place of the Anishinaabe in our migration from east to west. A place known as the, the place where the salt mother lives. A place known as the place where life begins and the place known as the mother. The mother, it's called the mother. Let me tell you about those places and where they are. This, this uh, place where the thunder beings move. If you go on the North Shore of Superior, we as Anishinaabe people have observed that the thunders start in the west and they move to the east and they stopped near what is now known as the city of Thunder Bay. But they stopped on a mountain there, and they would stop there. And so we would always uh, give many of our offerings to reaffirm the relationship that we have with the thunder beings and the, and the beings in the lake, and the balance that is created between those two sets of Manitouag spirits. spirits. And uh, so we would give offerings. Many people go there for a vision quest and um, to that mountain. Now, that mountain isn't called you know, the mountain of the thunder beings. It's called Mount McKay which illustrates one of the problems I have with America, which is the naming of large mountains after small men. Yeah. And it's epidemic, you know? And, and everybody knows I have, nothing, I have nothing against men of any size. It's just the question of how somehow in our psychology or in an American psychology, there is this naming of something as immortal as a mountain after something as mortal as a human. Right? Amen. And then besides that, you know, there's the naming and claiming and putting your flag on it. Amen. Right? Which has to do with empire. Mm -hmm. And then it has to do subsequently with how we relate to place. Because place loses its name or its spirit place. It becomes something that is named after someone who kind of blew through for 40 years. And a lot of those guys were bad guys. You know, McKay is not a bad guy, but you know, you got Harney Peak and the heart of everything that is and the Black Hills of South Dakota, one of the most sacred places, you know, named after a guy who killed a whole bunch of Lakotas. Mm -hmm. You know, Pikes Peak, you know, just the whole, all of Colorado. And then, you know, in more recent, you know, Kit Carson National Forest, how can you name a national forest after a guy like Kit Carson? Mm -hmm. You know, killed, you know, killed people, you destroyed an ecosystem, you know? So it is something that I think merits kind of a reconsideration. And, you know, the question is, is it possible? You know, and I, I, I know it is. Um, this, this second place that we... Uh, uh, well, let me just talk about the possibility, in case I will get to it later, which is, as you know, there used to be a mountain called Mount McKinley, and it's called now? Denali, right? Uh, there used to be a place in the middle, a big rock in the middle of Australia, it used to be called Ayers Rock, called Uluru. Right? Probably didn't need too much counseling. It was okay, right? <laughs> then there was the Cecil Rhodes, the Rhodes Scholar guy. He didn't even have a mountain named after him. He had a country, Rhodesia, right? <laughs> called Zimbabwe now. And then there's some place up there. It's called, uh, used to be called, I think, Queen Charlotte Islands off of British Columbia. We'll have to work on that British thing still, British Columbia thing. But about a year ago, it was renamed Haida Gwaii. You know, and why? Because the Haida's lived there for 10,000 years or so. Probably better name than, I'm pretty sure that no queen ever saw. Right? So, this is this, you know, process of naming and claiming and undoing that I think merits, you know, consideration. The idea of uh, this place called the place where our, the sixth resting place of the Anishinaabe and I migration, that is um, what is known as Spirit Mountain, just south of Duluth. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of you are probably aware of this story, and, and I am like probably many of you in that, you know, many days I, I hear about some really bad idea, and I just hope it goes away, <laughs> right? Because, you know, sometimes you're just hoping that someone else has got that one, or it's just a really bad idea and it's gone, you know? And I kept hearing about this idea, and I was like, oh, this is not good. And, you know, as I said, I'm a member of our Medewin Society, and then um, some Native people from Duluth, they gave me tobacco to help them. They said, would you intervene and go talk to our city council? Because the city council had issued a permit to open a golf course on Spirit Mountain. And they said, would you go and testify, you know, at the city council? And I said, yeah. So I drove over from White Earth, you know, and I was just, you know, it's about three, three and a half hours. And I uh, got over there and I was kind of nervous, may surprise you, but I get nervous when I talk a lot of times and, you know, I, but I talked to our Medellin people before, I said, what should I say? They said, well, tell them our migration story. You know, how, on the, you know, it was where we, we, we went and uh, from Duluth is where we saw where it was we were to go, or from the Spirit Mountain, you know. And it's interesting because the Cheyenne people started there and moved west. The Cheyenne are our relatives, which I did not know until I went to see the Cheyenne, you know. Um, and, uh, but they, they're, their origin is at that spirit mountain or where they got their medicine. So very, it's not just to us, to other people, you know. And um, so I went to testify and there was this big debate, you know, it's not unlike running for vice president. There's this big debate on if uh, they would let me talk. And actually there's these signs in Duluth that said, let Winona talk. You know, because the city council said, you know, first they gave me a minute, you know, time, and then they said, no, she can't talk. I was like, <laughs> you know, what is this? You know, and then they gave me three minutes to talk. And, you know, if you guys hang out with me for a little while, you know I can get a lot into three minutes and I'm out of there. You know, so I was like, I, I accept your terms, just let me talk, you know? And so I went in there and I was nervous. And I go in there and um, that room was packed. Pretty much every religious denomination came, you know, and all the native people from our region came, you know, elected and spiritual leaders. And, uh, and um, I spoke, you know, and I told that story. And then uh, in succession, other people came up to say the same thing and to support our right to religious freedom, right? Which was a good day for Duluth, you know? And it was interesting because then this guy gets up from the city council and he has like a Xerox like this and he folds it, pulls it out and he says, Ms. LaDuke, I have a question to ask you. And I'm like, okay. He says, um, it says here, I'm reading a anthropologist's report on an explorer's journal. And it says that you're wrong. That in fact, the Ojibwe's arrived with the fur traders to this area. He says so right here. And I, you know, I said, well, that's a, you know, I listened to him and I said, that's an interesting story. I said, you know, I, I am sure, I am sure that there was some Ojibwe that hitched a ride with fur traders, <laughs> you know, and whatever he had to say to get that ride, like, oh, you have discovered something new. And my people have never seen this place before. I mean, I'm sure he was hitching. I'm sure he said whatever he wanted to say, you know. I said, but the rest of us were here, pretty sure, you know, because according to our, you know, our oral tradition. But I just want to point this out because this is what it is like in the year 2000 in Duluth is that some guy on the city council will correct your oral history. And that as a native person, you know, you're not viewed as having the same standing, right? And so that question is not a history, you know, I mean, you have the same thing with Highway 55, right here. And the question of, you know, and so it became the question of how sacred is it? Is it, you know, can you guys tell us how sacred this place is? How, you know, can you have multiple use of this site? Like, so it's like, can you pray between the sixth and seventh hole? You know, <laughs> right? You know, but this whole, and then quantifying what is sacred, right? So how, how do you quantify what is sacred? I, you know, I'm not in charge of that, but it is this interesting paradigm and discussion that I'm gonna discuss a little bit later, but the idea of a, of a country founded on, you know, the doctrine of discovery and Christian legal institutions that then comes to judge non-Christian, institutions and practices that have existed for thousands of years on this land. Mm -hmm. And as Native people, that's where we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves, as, as Fool's Crow would say, you know, I was very blessed to know Frank Fool's Crow, one of the great chiefs of the Lakota. He said, uh, the court of the thief. That's what he referred it to it as, as a Native person. You go in there and you're like, I'm, I got a prayer for justice here, I'm not sure, you know? But it's interesting because you're in, in a, different, uh, a different justice system 
that does not understand your paradigm, doesn't understand your worldview. So in this case, um, the city council voted to revoke the uh, permit, and then I was very pleased, and then this, the mayor, who was not there, vetoed it. And I said, this is, this is like a really bad example of democracy. I said, because I didn't see like the big pro golf course movement. You know what I'm saying? I literally saw one developer in kind of a bad suit. And, and I saw, you know, all these other people that were like, we got enough golf courses, we might need to make sure we got some sacred sites, right? You know? And then at the, you know, at the other end of it, you know, but he, that mayor eventually did lose his seat in the next round, and, and they still don't have a golf course, you know? But, you know, they, I mean, we don't have a strong, we need a stronger, you know, in Minnesota, as in many other states, we need a stronger ability to support the preservation of sacred sites. You know, you have an executive order, 13007, but you don't have state law or protection of sacred sites, you know, for, for indigenous peoples. Um, the place where the Salt Mother lives is a place in Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico, and I just tell this story because it, um, you know, they say a long time ago the Salt Mother lived with the Zunis, and then they offended her and she moved. And I could tell that same story of the Ojibwe's, but it is what humans do, we botch things up, you know? And so parts of creation just move on. You know, and that's what happened to the Zunis, they say. And so the Salt Mother moved, and she moved a little bit south of their reservation, I guess is what you would say, or where she had been living. And so it's called Zuni Salt Lake. If any of you go near Gallup, don't go there, because it's like a sacred place. And so that's one of the things about sacred places, that doesn't mean we all go there. Yeah. You know? Sometimes you just stay out. Like, I went there, but I don't go there. My uh, then 11-year-old son went and collected salt with the men, because the men collect the salt. And I watched from up on the hill. My, my little guy is like, Mom, that was really far. <laughs> you know, so you had to walk way down there, and it's this salt. It's a lake, and it has salt, salt, and then it has a cinder, salt cinder cone in the middle, and it's a spring-fed lake. And that's the Zuni salt mother, right? And it traditionally is a sanctuary for salt, and they use that for all their ceremonies. That it's you know for the for you know in their uh, in all their sacred practices, and and uh, you know I'm not from that area, but it's very important to them. And uh, their problem, uh, their problem is uh, city of Phoenix is their problem, far away. But city of Phoenix, if you go to that area, I don't know if you hear it, it sounds kind of like a giant sucking sound. You know, to me, because it's you know, if you got a competition between which is the ecologically most destructive cities in the country, someplace between Phoenix and Las Vegas, I'm thinking, you know, L.A., Phoenix, Las Vegas, just bad planning, no planning, Albuquerque not far behind, you know, just continuous sprawl, bad karma, ecologically, right? That's the reality, you know, and. Um, so the Salt River Authority, which is a power company, was running out of coal in this one coal mine, and they wanted to open up a new coal mine near Zuni Salt Lake. And it's, of course, a ways away, you know, and this is one of the challenges that, you know, you, I'm sure, face, um, which is the idea of, um, you know, proposals are forwarded, environmental impact statements, and then there's a discussion of mitigation. The question of no is usually not brought up, right? And, and this is a huge moral and ethical question, which needs to be asked in the society is no. No would be an answer sometimes. No, just no. You know, and so in, in the case of most of us, you know, who have to fight these projects, you end up battling in, in I'm not gonna say exhausting yourselves, but you know, I've, I've been at this 30 years and sometimes it's damn tiring. You know, those tar sands are huge, you know. In this case, you know, they, they wanna mine it and. So the Zunis and the, the Sierra Club and the, you know, all the indigenous people joined and kept after them, you know, and, uh, and they ran, they had spiritual ceremonies, they had administrative hearings, they had litigation, you know, everything that you do. And, um, you know, and, and you know what, in the end, this is how you know you win, when they say, we've decided it's no longer economical to mine. <laughs> They're like, that's great, thank you. You know, they don't say you're right. You know, they're saying it's not economical, which if any of you watched the, our battle over Big Stone 2, also known as BS2, the big coal plant they wanted to put over in, in the South Dakota border, just like a bad idea, you know? And in the end, that was the same determination. It was uneconomical. I was like, yeah, sure is. 
this is a bad idea to start with, you know. So they, they won, but, you know, what they did is, is they shipped their coal in from Wyoming. So they didn't quit combusting. They didn't get a more efficient plan, right, which is the, the nature of empire. You got a predator-prey relationship and you got an empire that requires constant consumption. It's highly inefficient, you know, and requires constant intervention into other people's territories and constant violations of other people's human rights. That's the reality of the empire, you know. And so, you know, what happened at Zuni is, is a story that could be told and retold and retold and retold and retold. And, you know, I generally work with the people who are on the end of it trying to hang in there and battle, you know. And we're, you know, we're, we're, we're hanging, you know. We're, we're tough, but, you know, we don't have, uh, we're very, we're tough. That's what we got going for us. And there's a lot of good people, you know, that believe the right thing. And uh, in my experience, the longer you battle, the more expensive their bad projects are. That's just how that works, you know. And uh, any of you, you know, know this kind of thing, it's true, you know. And, and sometimes they just fall off because it's uneconomical 10 years down the road, you know. But, you know, Zuni is the same as, as, the, as the story of um, um, the place where life begins. That's a story that doesn't have an answer yet. The place of life, where life begins is where 150,000 caribou calve their youngs in what is known as the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. But the Gwich'in call it the place where life begins, which sounds a lot different than Section 2009, yes. right? Or, you know, some photo put up by some Alaskan senator beholden to oil companies that says this is what it looks like in winter. You know, the place where the caribou calf are young, the place where life begins. 150,000 caribou calf are young. Probably a more apt description, right? And if we knew it as that place, would we think differently? You know? But it is the nature of this empire, which is largely in a, in a temporal, I mean, this area here, as a, as a, as a te more temperate zone that rather than the Arctic or the subarctic, that we, re we view those areas as, you know, places where one can mine and put oil because they are not considered comfortably, you know, inhabitable by people like us. So there's this whole view of place that we uh, manifest in our policy. And that story has not finished, and nor has the story of the mother, which is the Grand Canyon. Yeah. One would think that the seventh wonder of the world would be exempt from uranium mining, mm -hmm. but it is not. The state of Arizona just issued three permits to Denison, the Canadian Mining Corporation. Very interesting that all the mines in the U.S. are largely being opened, not all of them, but most of them are being opened by Canadian and, and uh, French mm -hmm. corporations. And so you have this whole globalization of a bad idea, which continues, right? The nuclear power bad idea, right? And somehow someplace that I would consider to be probably above uranium mining, the Grand Canyon, which is the place, the birthplace of the Zuni, yeah. of the Havasupai and the Hopi, the Mother Canyon, you know, would be something that would be worth protecting. Yeah? And so somehow I feel like that that's another place where you stop. So the questions that I kind of forward to you is, is somehow in this idea, you know, first of all, you know, Native American religious freedom is largely not protected under the law. We had the passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act um, in 1978. And, but with that, um, you know, still no protection for places that you pray, right? And so you don't have the substance behind the, the law. And then there's this larger question, which I think is the question of empire, which is, is it possible that the Holy Land is not an exclusive, uh, exclusive concept, you know? I believe the Holy Land is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we refer to and understand place differently as sacred, you know, that the Holy Land is also here, then maybe will we relate differently, you know? These are the questions that I, you know, uh, deliberate upon, you know, and I present to you because this is your, this is your area. But um, within that, let me talk a little bit about the paradigms of empire and, the, and, the, and sustainability. And then uh, I'll probably have some, some uh, open some for some questions. Um, but saying that, you know, I always, I have a new, I have a new, mm, what would you call it? In terms of the fabulous is my word, my not word is Midwest. 
I don't know how to talk, tell, talk to you about this, but the Midwest is like a state of mind. It does not exist. Where is the Midwest? <laughs> you know, I always say I'm from the Great Lakes. You know what I'm saying? Because that's Omaha King, there are lakes here. The mid, middle of what west? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm kind of pleading with you to kind of rethink the naming of our region, even because I don't know what the middle Midwest is. I, I don't have it. And, and the West is in itself a state of mind of empire. You know, because it's always, there was like a new West, a new frontier, someplace new to go, and you know, it turns out we've run out of places to conquer and places to go, and there's no more manifest destiny. We gotta be done, you know? And so within that, I'm kind of pleading with you to consider dropping that Midwest thing. I don't know how that's gonna go in my long list of requests to the dominant society, but <laughs> I just put it out there. Um, <laughs> That is a paradigm of empire. I'm going to ask that you kind of think about deconstructing and considering what uh, it looks like to have a different worldview. And you are all a pretty enlightened bunch, so I'm not, you know, I'm sure it's not too big of a leap. But in our traditions, we have some teachings. I would say Gichi Tabwewen is, is the phrase, which is Gichi Tabwewen, which means the great law. And one would translate generally to say, the Creator's law is the highest law, higher than the laws made by nations, states, or municipalities. One would do well to live in accordance with the Creator's law. What do we know about the Creator's law? We know uh, that most things which, are, things which are natural are cyclical. Like our seasons, right? Like our months, like our bodies, like water cycles, right? Those are cyclical. We know in our teachings, um, many of our nouns are animate. We know that life is not just inhuman, and life, that the questions of animate and inanimate are, are to an extent, amount of paradigm. That is to say that the word asin, the word for rock in Ojibwe, is an animate noun. So what does that mean? You know, in our teachings, a lot of times when we go to our sweat lodge, we use, we call them grandfathers, those rocks. So it, it is a worldview that views, you know, outside. I think the word is Maui. Let me see what it is. I was looking at this. I was in New Zealand recently, and they were telling me, it means the life force that exists in all beings. Yeah, Mwai, Mwai, the inter internal life force of every entity human or human animate or inanimate. And I know that this is a discussion that is had in your circles. We have a teaching of Nindinawe Maganatuk, which means we are all related. We are all related. Um, whether we have wings or fins or roots, we are all related. The ceremony that I did was, called, was the bear ceremony because that was one of our relatives and uh, a very significant relative for our, for our people. But we have, uh, um, you know, we have that recognition that we are entirely dependent on our relatives. They are not like that sheep thing. They, you know, many of our relatives don't need us though. You know, I'm pretty sure the eagles, they're good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, many of our relatives do not actually need us. But we need them, you know, because we are uh, Gitimagus, we're pitiful, you know, whether it is for food or whether it is for, yeah, we are totally dependent on our relatives. And we are all related, all of us here, I mean, which I know bummed out the white supremacists, <laughs> you know, because we're like 99.9% .9 the same, you know, and I'm sure, I don't know what to tell them, sorry, <laughs> you know. I'm sorry sometimes too, you know. <laughs> we have a, uh, you know, and we have a, a teaching that uh, one would call um, reciprocity, um, which is when you take something, you always leave something. You're always thankful, and um, you only take what you need and you leave the rest. Um, I was reading, I mean, it's just a practice. When you harvest medicinal plants, I don't know if you guys ever, or mushrooms, you know, mushrooms is a good example. You can't take them all, right? You gotta leave some of those guys to come back. 
right? And if you're disrespectful and you mess, mess up there, they won't be there, right? That's, where that, that's how that teaching is manifest, you know, a lot of times. And then there is um, a teaching that in each deliberation we consider the impact upon the seventh generation from now. And I think that that is a very good teaching of sustainability. Um, so, that's quite a bit different than the teachings of empire, right? Instead of viewing um, creator's law as the highest law, we believe that man is in charge of laws. So we do things like change recommended daily allowances of pollutants according to who's in power, designate or redesignate Superfund sites, right? right. Um, you know, until you got 100,000 chemicals in the environment with no idea as to their combined impact, pretty much, right? Trade pollution credits, right? Instead of believing that um, we live in a, that we are all related, we're very anthropocentric. We're like all about number one. And there's a perception of entitlement. And so we have come to consume the vast majority of the biosphere. Right? Instead of believing or understanding the principles of sustainability associated with cyclical thinking, and also the teachings of, of uh, animate, that the world around us is alive, we live in a society which commodifies most things. You know, whether it is commodification of water, resources, um, commodification of allocations of fish in the ocean, um, you know, that there's a price tag or that a forest is viewed as in terms of its board feet of lumber, right? Instead of <clears throat> viewing that um, we, are, we are not a cyclical society, we're a linear society in our thinking. And the two examples of that I give you, uh, there's an economics of linear. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, but that would be the perfect example of that. Instead of having a cyclical economy, which might manage um, materials a little better, we are a society which produces a lot of stuff for consumption and then throws it away. So you got 50 trillion pounds of waste a year produced in this country not including wastewater, which I'm not sure how you can make wastewater. You know what I'm saying? Because they aren't making any new water, so I don't, I'm not sure where that, and, and so you have basically a linear production economy, which is in itself unsustainable. And, you know, in that, the, 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 perhaps the simplest question might see it, say, you know, if you got 50 trillion pounds of waste, when they say throw it away, this one young woman asked me that. When they say throw it away, where is away? That's a linear economy. We, have, you know, we, we don't have an away plan, whether it's nuclear waste or carbon or garbage. They're waiting for the nuclear waste ferry down there at Prairie Island from what I see. You know, I could see, I, I'm pretty sure there's none, you know? And then there is the question of um, the social production of waste, which we have in this society very, very, we're prolific at it, which would be prisons, right? We create waste people. And on a worldwide scale, there's 9 million prisoners, 9 point some, and 2.1 million of them are in the US. We've got a prison industrial complex. That's a linear production of waste, right? And then you have uh, the question of seventh generation thinking and pretty much not. We're down to quarterly profits, right? Which is the antithesis. So the question that's then become, and I will talk more about it tomorrow, you know, in the deconstructing of empire, there is no easy practice. But the, what there is, is the possibility of, of rethinking where we are and having the courage to do that. Because in itself, you know, you are all leaders. And you have this opportunity to talk to people that I would never talk to. 
And in that, sometimes, you know, and obviously it is easier for you to talk to a lot of people than it is for me. That's really important to recognize because, um, you know, in that opportunity and that privilege, there's this responsibility to say, hey, I know it's really comfortable here in Empire, you know, but it's not going to pan out over the long haul, right? Which is just the reality. And so what are we willing to have in our comfort, you know, step outside of our arenas of comfort to discuss? So let me pose a few and then I'll open for questions. Let me pose the idea, for instance, of, um, they're interesting ideas. I mean, the first might be the idea of the doctrine of discovery. Have you all heard of this? How many of you have heard of the doctrine of discovery? Okay. Excuse my lack of uh, ability to pronounce the Pope's words, but and there's something called the doctrine of discovery, and there is a move, um, the Episcopal Church has repudiated it. There's a number of other Christian churches who are repudiating the doctrine of discovery based on the request of the indigenous communities, and I'm going to tell you why. That is because um, in 1455, Pope Nicholas, by way of his order, uh, Romanus Pontifex, I'm not sure on that one, but gave Portugal's King Alfonso, Alfonso V permission to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens, got that one, I don't know, and pagans whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ, wheresoever placed, and the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. The Catholic Church was, you know, I, when I was lecturing to the Unitarians, I said, <laughs> I said the handmaiden to colonialism. No, they said the, it was the driver, you know. The reality is, is that, the, that the, the doctrine of discovery and the papal doctrine justify the practice of genocide, justify the practice of appropriation of everybody's wealth, of slavery. And one might recognize that some of that, you know, has subdued some. But the reality is, is that a good portion of that empire is inherited. We live in empire today, which is a beneficiary of this historic empire. And in terms of most indigenous peoples on a worldwide scale, including those in the United States, we are still victims of the doctrine of discovery. How would that be? For instance, in general, the Diocese of South Dakota, Bishop Creighton Robertson told the Episcopal Church in 2008 that just after the Civil War, the U.S. government offered various Christian denominations land in exchange for their complicity in its effort to force Indians to assimilate into white settlers' culture so that they would be farmers instead of hunters and gatherers or warriors. The Episcopal Church, as you know, the church is divided up territory. You guys are a little bit behind the United Church, but basically the rest of them were busy divvying up Indian country, right? The doctrine of discovery also served as the foundation for federal Indian law in this country. That is to say, the Supreme Court in 1823 ruled that the federal government held title to Indian lands as the inheritor of European colonization. It said that indigenous people had a right to occupy the land, but not to own it. Now that has cursed us since that Supreme Court decision in 1823. And it remains doctrine under federal law and Supreme Court precedent. So we remain victims of what edicts that came from Rome. And so one of the requests that has been forwarded over the past two decades, including the Lakotas who went to the Vatican, was please denounce the doctrine of discovery because it has huge legal implications in the American legal system and in our communities on a day-to-day -day basis. A second note one might do in the process of undoing empire is, of course, the idea of apology. And you all know the U.S. is not good at apologizing. You know, actually, I was, I was looking at this. My, my friend here was helping me download. 
And um, you know, the apology thing is not good with Native people. But in, in uh, so the best example of that is in uh, 1990, the Lakota people went to the, the descendants of the survivors of the Wounded Knee Massacre, went to the US Congress and asked for an apology for the Wounded Knee Massacre. And they asked for the revocation of the 23 Congressional Medals of Honor which were awarded, right, for that massacre. And Tom Daschle, who was then the South Dakota Senator, said, if we apologize to the Lakotas, we'll have to apologize to a lot of other people too, yeah. right? And so this whole, like, how you make good, we're still in that process, you know? And not that apology solves things. I mean, they got a few things here. There's, in 2009, there was a law, but it was never presented formally. It's kind of like signed. And it's like, so it's kind of like when your brother, you, you know, your brother, you're seven and your brother's nine, and he kicks you. And your mom says for him to apologize, and then he goes and apologizes to the wall. Do you know what I'm saying? Does it count? Does it count if they issued an apology, but they never presented it? And it was, you know what I'm saying? So we did get an apology here a couple years ago. Obama signed another apology, but nobody ever heard anything about it. There was no presentation of the apology. Just thought I'd mention that. It's just kind of a, how you undo what is the, what do you call it? The, you know, just the justification. They got something in, in uh, Australia called National Sorry Day. I really like that. I forget what day that is, but I thought that was a hilarious name, National Sorry Day. I apologize for the boarding schools, but anyway. The U.S. Uh, has not yet formally approved the U.N. Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. I don't know if you've ever followed this. 30 years in the making, passed the General Assembly in 2007, did not get, get, uh, get uh, approved yet by the U.S. The four holdout countries, of all the countries in the General Assembly, the four holdout countries. Does anybody know this? Australia? New Zealand. Isn't that interesting? Such upstanding world citizens could not sign on to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, right? Now, there was some folding. New Zealand folded last year. Australia folded the year before, and Canada, I think Canada, did, I don't know, do you remember if Canada folded or is folding or is bending? <laughs> Doing some yoga position? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And the U.S. is kind of in the yoga position too. So, you know, what am I telling you? That's, you know, it's, it's these theoretical places. And then the last in the theoretical place, and then I'm going to quit, was the awesome passage about two weeks ago by the Bolivian government on the Rights of Mother Earth Act, which was in, in, put in their constitution. And I thought, now that's one enlightened country, and, and oh, that's right, that president is indigenous, huh? Right? But I thought, you know, here we are, we got private property, we got, you know, all this other stuff, but the Rights of Mother Earth not enshrined anywhere. So what they have, um, basically, Mother Earth and all beings of which she is composed have the following inherent rights, the right to life and to exist, the right to be respected, the right to generate its biocapacity and continue its vital cycles and processes free of human disruptions, the right to maintain identity and integrity as a distinct self-regulating and interrelated being, the right to water, right to clean air, the right to be free from contamination, pollution, or toxic or radioactive waste, the right to not have its genetic structure modified or disrupted in a manner which threatens its integrity or the vitality, vital and healthy functioning. Every being has a right to well-being and to live free from torture or cruel treatment by human beings. Interesting rights that I think are moral rights should be discussed in the church and should be discussed and adopted, you know, in this country, you know, maybe starting with the churches, I'm not sure. But, you know, I, I give you those, so that's kind of the big theoretical discussion, and then tomorrow I thought I'd, because I'm hanging out with you guys tomorrow, and so I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, growing corn. Growing corn. And, and uh, the, the economics of, um, 
empire and what it looks like and what the next one looks like. But, um, you know, in the end, I guess what I would say, aside from thank you, is, is it is, uh, empire is a, is a, a worldview. Um, empire is a practice. An empire, a society based on conquest is not sustainable. Right? And, and, the, and the deconstructing of that thinking requires, you know, spiritual strength, depth, courage, and, you know, a good heart and a good mind. So, thank you, Miigwech. Cindy Best says I got a couple questions. Yes. Um, when you talk about apology, um, that immediately comes to mind for me um, the United Church of Christ, uh, like I think in the late 90s, I'm not sure exactly, made a formal apology and some restitution in, um, to the people of Hawaii in relation to um, missionary, destructive missionary work that was done there. And I would appreciate it if you would comment on your um, your sense of how that was, you know, what you know about that, your sense of whether that was a process of integrity and whether that might be a model. Yes, you are right. I should have, um, this, it's, if you look up on the internet, history of apology, <laughs> it's interesting. I was like, ah, oh. but the, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, the case was in Hawaii. You, you, 1991, UCC apologizes to indigenous people of Hawaii. General Synod issued a formal apology for the, overthrow, for the church's complicity in the U.S. military's 1893 overthrow of the Hawaiian monarch and later annexation. Um, what would I say? Great. You know, good, good start. I mean, you know, I think it's, it's very good. I think that it needs to mean something. You know, in the last round I was in Hawaii, the native Hawaiians haul me out there because, I mean, some of you know we had this battle on whether the, the university's right to genetically engineer wild rice, yes. right? Which is like some things, like, I just believe the words wild rice should not be associated with the words genetic engineering, <laughs> you know? Like, you know, I'm just not clear where they got that idea, right? So anyway, the Hawaiians asked us to come out there because they are trying to genetically engineer taro, which is their sacred food, a part of their, it's called cosmogenealogy. They, they came from... Uh, Taro was their older brother, which is what they make poi out of. You know what I'm talking about? So anyway, make a long story short, I wanted the churches to come in on this. I did not see the movement. You know what I'm saying? And you still got, you know, the militarization of Hawaii, which is huge. I mean, Schofield, they just found DU, depleted uranium, Oliver Schofield barracks. I'm like, that's like, who was on that watch? You know, and as a con you know what I'm saying? It's like endless. Hawaii is like an endless example of really bad empire, right? And the, and there are, the churches are so prolific there. And I know that it's, you know, but it's like, I have to say that the Quakers are right out there. And I'm not sure, you know, the Quakers are good, you know, and I'm sure, I, I don't know how many UCCs there are out there, but, you know, let's go. You know, that's what I feel like. You know what I'm saying is that they, you got terrain battles that are huge out there over the militarization, over the genetic engineering issues, over the, the rights of Hawaiians to land. I mean, to be a Native Hawaiian is worse legally than to be a Native American, by a long shot. Their rights are so few and so trampled on, you know? And my theory, to be honest with you, is price of real estate, you know? They do not want to rec you know, recognize those people out there because, you know, the reality is, is, that, is that Native Hawaiians have rights to about 50% of the state, you know? And it is just uh, horrendous that, you know, how many homeless Hawaiians there are and, you know, let alone how many are in prison and, you know, and cannot practice their way of life because you got a, um, a mall or a, you know, a big hotel, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, I think it was a great start. Churches should apologize, you know, as, a, as you know, the practice is good. I, I find it, you know, I, I practice saying I'm sorry sometimes, you know, <laughs> it's funny. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so, you know, I don't know if you ever have, I mean, I'm very human, and anybody who knows me, sometimes I have a conflict with my staff, one of my, you know, people I work with, and I'm like, okay, Winona, and I got to say, I'm sorry, I'm going to say, sorry, sorry. So I have to practice it in the morning, and then I go in, and I can say it, 
You know, sometimes it's a little tough. I'm, I'm a little more evolved, but you know, some days it's a tough one. You know, but then it should mean something, yeah. right? You know, the conflict should be reduced. Yeah. So I've been thinking about empire this week, uh, the killing of Osama. That's very much. One of the things that's troubled me the most about that is the language of empire that calls that justice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. And starting with our president and everyone else who talks about it. To me, that's something the churches need to address. This has nothing to do with justice. It's all about empire. Mm -hmm. And but for our children to learn that, well, that's justice. Mm -hmm. uh, this this is a terrible uh, act of empire, as far as I'm concerned. It is, and I, you know, I have to say, I was a little out of out of uh, reach where I was on the island. If, if you know, because you're up there, it's like, but. Um, did you notice what they said when they went in there? It's E-K-I-A Geronimo. That's what they said. Geronimo. That's what they said. That was what they, the command was. Enemy killed in action Geronimo. And, you know, actually, uh, you want to hold up that book in the back that's sitting, I have a book, it's called Militarization of Native America. It's, it's just getting released. There you go. This here is um, Honor the Earth is going to have it available on our website, but it's basically the question of how Indian wars and empire continued, you know, until this point where today, you know, I just wrote a book on it, it's don't even get me started how, you know, but it's so, whether it's the Black Hawk helicopter or the, you know, the Apache or the going off the reservation or the 7th Cavalry going into Iraq or the Donald Rumsfeld, you know, lecturing to Fort Carson with a bunch of guys that look like Indian scouts, or, you know what I'm saying, it's like, it is endless, or I was just out in, in Colorado, and, and they're trying to get them to not have Columbus Day, you know, and every year there's people that protest, and they're kind of like, can you just call it, like, Happy Italian Day, you know, but it's not, that wasn't what it was about to start with, it was always about empire, you know, and this idea, I mean, you know, so, I mean, I'm not a fan of Columbus Day, as you can imagine, I mean, it's just a ridiculous proposition, you know. That got a little tangential, but yes, war is about empire. And I was going to talk about that tomorrow. So if you're here, that's what I was going to talk about more than that. Yes. yes. I just wanted to recommend a book that I've been reading. Uh, my dad gave to me, my 85-year-old father. Uh, it's called Empire of Debt. And mm. it sounds like it's really, maybe other people have read it, but it sounds like it's really heavily economic. And it is economic, but it's really about empire. and it, I'm just confounded at how that decision to be a military empire, have, it really has undermined our entire culture since about 1947. And I'm just inflamed having read this book and I've heard you be speaking to empire. It undergirds everything. And I, I'm so, I don't know how we're going to get at the bottom of it and pull back from this. The grassroots is going to be so big necessary to overturn it all. Well, come to my lecture tomorrow. Oh, I'll, back. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for having me.